The US Department of Defense is working on a new definition of irregular warfare, which it currently states is a violent struggle among state and non-state actors for legitimacy and influence over the relevant populations. Now, the term irregular warfare therefore leans more to unconventional military activity practiced by armed groups, or partisans, insurgents and terrorists, more than by direct conventional military action with tanks and planes. But in the Ukraine war, we've seen irregular activity, such as sabotage, spying and propaganda conducted by regular state forces. We've seen the devastating impact of the destruction of the Novokokovka Dam, for example, either by Russian direct action or incompetence, which may make brief tactical sense to Russia, but if deliberate, is nowadays classed as a war crime. If you're after a mission statement for irregular warfare, you can't get much better than Winston Churchill's entreaty in 1940 to the newly created Special Operations Executive to set Europe ablaze. That we shall never cease to persevere against them. The Special Operations Executive was formally established in July 1940. Paris had fallen. The miracle of deliverance that was Dunkirk had just ensured Britain would be able to fight another day. Its purpose was to conduct sabotage, reconnaissance and other Comrade Garden spy stuff in occupied Europe and later also in occupied Southeast Asia. It helped supply, train, direct and on occasion lead local resistance movements. Such activity called for an original and free-flowing mindset in the men and women who served unencumbered by the rigid doctrines of regular military requirements. Living and operating often for months at a time amongst the enemy also called for nerves of steel as the chances of support upon being discovered were slim to nil. SOE agents became experts at demolition learning how much explosive was required to bring down a bridge and where exactly that should be placed, for example. They had to understand how industrial systems worked in order to pick apart the point of greatest vulnerability. Better, if possible, to slow down the enemy's production of tanks or planes in the first place than have to come up with ways to defeat those things in combat. On April the 29th this year, a Russian oil depot in Kazachia Bay in Sevastopol on Crimea went up in flames, the latest in a pattern of strikes in occupied Ukraine, in the Sea of Azov and inside Russia itself. Air bases and other military sites similarly have suddenly caught fire. Alexei Reznikov, Ukraine's defence minister, suggested these events were due to soldiers smoking in prohibited areas. Maybe, but I smell a rat and a lot of burning oil, obviously. There is much debate about how effective the SOE was. It had little direct impact on the battlefield in terms of tanks destroyed or enemy killed. But that wasn't really its purpose. It was there as a means of striking back where most other channels were closed, as a way to give heart to a nation feeling very unsure about its future, and a way to say to those trapped in the temporarily occupied territories that they hadn't been forgotten and that they weren't alone. Ukraine could do with a bit of that now. So Kyiv almost certainly sponsors the Freedom of Russia Legion and the Russian Volunteer Corps, despite the latter's alleged murky and far-right political leanings. The Freedom of Russia Legion are part of Ukraine's International Legion and has close ties to the country, although Kyiv denies responsibility for their raids. Meanwhile, Ukraine explicitly states the Russian Volunteer Corps is not part of Ukraine's armed forces. The group is considered far-right, it's led by Denis Kapustin, known as White Rex. He's a controversial figure, considered by some to be a neo-Nazi. Russia says he's a terrorist, and he does have a Schengen area-wide entry ban for the EU. He says he fights for a Russia that belongs to ethnic Russians. So maybe not an ideal first date, and certainly someone Kiev would like under the heading, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. But these groups are having some sort of impact. Sure, Taking a huge swathe of territory in southern Russia to allow Ukrainian troops to do the mother of all left hooks and outflank Moscow's forces camped in Ukraine would be incredible. But it literally would. It would not be credible. It's a nice idea, but it ain't going to happen. President Zelensky's forces could well be supplying weapons and other equipment 
to those inside Russia opposing Putin's regime. The mysterious drone activity over Moscow in recent weeks and recent bombings could well be the end result of such skullduggery. Two attacks stick out. First, last August, Daria Dugina, a Russian journalist and activist, was killed in a car bomb near Moscow. Dugina was the daughter of Alexander Dugin, a far-right political philosopher who supports Putin and his war. Next, prominent Russian war blogger Maxim Fomin, better known under the pen name Vladlin Tatarsky, was killed after a bust filled with explosives was delivered to a speech he was giving in a St. Petersburg cafe. Sabotage groups in Belarus have also destroyed rail lines and control equipment, slowing Moscow's ability to shift equipment as we saw after Russian troops were kicked out of the north of Ukraine last year. Like the SOE actions, these operations aren't going to win the war for Ukraine. What they are doing though is creating morale-boosting headlines for Ukraine's civilian audience, tired of being targeted in total contravention of the Geneva Conventions, night after night by drones and cruise missiles. Irregular warfare also ties up a small number of Russian troops and causes yet another headache for Putin and his defence officials. It was said that Hitler devoted half an hour of his daily intelligence update taking reports from his intelligence staff about resistance and partisan activity. Now, that may not be huge in a busy day, but it's still 30 minutes he would rather have spent on other things. If Ukraine can achieve that kind of effect, they'll be happy. Partisan and irregular operations aren't known for nothing as ungentlemanly warfare, a moniker ascribed to the SOE. They skirt around accepted military convention and can be said to increase the risk to civilians in certain circumstances. Ukraine would likely say the potential payoff is worth it. So as I watch parts of Putin's war machine decide to spontaneously leap into the air and scatter themselves over a wide area, I wonder if President Zelensky didn't some time ago modify Churchill's directive and say to a close-knit circle of his most trusted, artistic and inventive professional killers, set Russia ablaze. Defence In Depth is a weekly video output by The Telegraph of the big defence stories. If you'd like a daily fix of content about the war in Ukraine, I'd suggest Ukraine the Latest, The Telegraph's podcast. For more defence stories, we've left links in the description below. And if you have a topic you'd like us to cover, let us know in the comments. Please do visit our website for the latest updates, news and analysis. Or failing that, you can read the paper.